So, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Martin Burton. I'm the director of the UK Cochrane Centre, and I'm delighted to welcome you to Manchester for the Cochrane UK and Ireland Annual Symposium 2014. Now, I've been given a set of instructions by my team, and the first thing I have to do is to tell you about the fire arrangements. So, I need to point out that there is a fire exit here and behind you. Remember, the nearest exit may be behind you as well as in front of you. <laughs> if there's a sudden drop in cabin pressure, right? Oh, actually, no, hang on, that's a different, different speech, isn't it? So, um, if the meeting place that we have is under the arch by the canal in front of the building, if we need to uh, do that. Am I right in saying there's going to be a practice fire bell at some point during the meeting? I think there's going to be a short practice at some point, but uh, not today. Thank you. So welcome again. It's, it's, great, it's great to see you all here. Now, there are some, particularly, some people that we particularly want to welcome to this symposium. And, and one group of people we, we want to welcome are some students. For the first time this year, we had a competition whereby students of any healthcare discipline in the UK and Ireland were asked to produce a short prezi or video describing either a Cochrane review, a principle of evidence-based practice, or the, uh, something about the collaboration. And we had a, a lot of app, uh, entries, and we're delighted that the winners of those prizes are here today. So just before we start the session proper, I'm going to ask the prize winners to come forward. And Tom Wally from the HDA has kindly agreed to present the prizes. So if these people are here, I'd like to welcome Anwin Cope, who won our first prize, Kyung Min Kim, who won the second prize, Hala Al Hodiab, who won the third prize and shared that with Jamie Hartman Boyce. And if the four of you are here, please come forward. We'd love to, to greet you. Are you Anwin? I'd just also like to say thank you very much uh, to the people that applied for the consumer stipends. We'd like to welcome all the consumers here, but particularly those uh, who won the stipends. And also we would like to welcome those who won travel awards from Students for Best Evidence. It's nice to see you all here. Now, if this was an American television show, there'd be a commercial break and someone would say, now for a word from our sponsor. We have such a <laughs> word. <laughs> So I'm delighted, just before we get going, I'm delighted to ask Tom Wally, who is our funder, a very important post, just to say a few words to us. Tom, thank you. Thank you very much, Martin, and thank you very much for welcoming me today and asking me to speak briefly. Uh, this is an added bonus to the programme, so it's going to be very brief. So uh, first of all, nice to be at uh, a Cochrane Symposium again. Delighted to be here. I'd like to see so many people here and to see that Cochrane remains buoyant in the UK. So it's been a busy year. So one thing that's happened in the past year, of course, is that we've had the quinquennial review of all the CRGs, and we've renewed contracts with the CRGs. And some people are looking at this and thinking, why did we do that now, at a time when the collaboration is undergoing some perhaps fairly radical changes? And it might be seen that our renewal of the contracts might indeed be a barrier to change in the contract, a uh, barrier to change in Cochrane. So I should say that one reason why we did it is A, your contracts were coming to an end soon, and B, because looking at the state of public finances, we thought it is much safer if we have a guaranteed five-year contract ahead than if we depend on the vagaries of the public finances in uh, 18 months or, or two years' time. So that was why we decided to go ahead. But this is a time of change in the collaboration. And some people have been asking, why have we put a break point or potential review point in at two years? And we did it in the full knowledge that the, that the collaboration was undertaking a review and that there may be some fairly radical changes coming out of that. And I would actually encourage the collaboration to be radical in how it thinks about the future and how it reorganizes itself. I'm conscious that perhaps the configuration of Cochrane Review Groups is suboptimal, even within the UK, dare I say and that there could be changes made which would improve efficiencies. Uh, and this isn't about people's empires, it's around producing reviews for the benefit of the NHS and patients and the public. I should say that I think our funding for Cochrane activities is probably pretty secure. 
I can't say more than that because with the state of public finances, nothing is totally secure, but it's as secure as it can be. I would not expect that there will be any increase in funding over the next three to four years, other than inflationary rises. But conversely, I don't expect to find any decrease in funding either. So if I say there's a need to reconfigure some groups and groups to work more closely together, it's not because we're trying to save money. It's because I think we can be more efficient in how we use that funding. So I think um, part of the consideration underway at the moment and that will be carried on Hyderabad and so forth will address this. But it is a time to think radically about how efficient Cochrane can be. And this may mean abandoning some things you currently do in favour of things that are more valuable and more important. It's not for me or NIHR as a funder to tell you how to do this. Uh, we're there to support you in your activities because I'm convinced that you will continue to do a good job for the public. So I think that's about all I wanted to say, Martin. And uh, I'll hand over. I should never stand before a dame. It's always causing me trouble. So I'll leave it to you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> And I'd like to, I'd like to say, th th Tom, thank you for coming. It means, it means that it's good to know that our funders are interested in what we're doing and really want to carry on this dialogue uh, with us. So last year, Professor Dame Sally Davis set us a number of challenges, and one was to make Cochrane reviews useful, usable, and to get them used. So that became a theme for this year's meeting. And we have seven excellent plenary speakers who I'll introduce you to as we go along uh, today and tomorrow. Now, last year, the meeting, I have to say, in the form of Sally Davis, was opened by an influential, dynamic friend of the collaboration. So I thought, let's do the same again this year. So I saw no reason to change. And Nikki Cullum has been a coordinating editor of the Cochrane Wounds Group for nearly 20 years and is a world leader in nursing research. Now, you know, when a colleague is uh, honored and recognized for their hard work and achievement, it's always a pleasure. Um, when it's a friend, it's a double pleasure, isn't it? But actually, when it's a member of the family, it's particularly special. And Nikki, you're a faithful member of the Cochrane UK family, and we're very proud of your achievements, and we were delighted with the announcement uh, last year or earlier this year. So it gives me great pleasure to invite Professor Dame Nikki Callum to speak to us. Good afternoon, everybody, friends, colleagues, collaborators. That teared me up, actually, Martin. I was going to start crying before I even started speaking. Great to be here. It's a real honour to address you and to welcome you to Manchester, which is my new academic home, if not my real home. You, you don't know how difficult it is for somebody from Leeds to say welcome to Manchester. <laughs> but you're very welcome anyway. So um, I'm going to... Um, it's really taken me a lot of thought to put this talk together. I hope it works. But I've had to sort of think some thoughts about, well, look at the evidence that we have as to whether Cochrane reviews are used, whether people find them useful, and how we might make them more useful and increase their use. It's a big challenge. So my plan, and I do have one, is um, to start off with a bit of a historical context. Not all of us have been around um, for, uh, really frightens me, 20 years, really. I'm, I don't count the days, but uh, not all of us have been around since the beginning, and thank goodness for that. We want new people, new blood, new energy, new thoughts involved in this endeavour. But I wanted to give a bit of a historical context and then talk about what is the evidence that Cochrane's used, that the evidence is useful, and that... How can, th let's think about how we can make it more usable. And there's going to be a little bit of a nursing, midwifery, allied health professional spin on this, just because that's what I am. I'm a nurse by background, and I, you know, I don't think we get enough airtime, so we're going to get some, <laughs> some airtime. It's not going to dominate things, but some consideration in this talk. So just to very briefly, let's not get, get bogged down in Archie, but... Um, just to recap briefly about Archie's original criticism that we have not organised a critical summary by specialty adapted periodically of all relevant randomised controlled trials. You, know, you couldn't argue with that. That makes so much sense. And Ian, Chalmers and colleagues, as we know, seized that 
challenge. Ob obstetrics and gynaecology got the wooden spoon. They put themselves to amassing the RCTs in the Oxford Database Clinical Trials of producing what now seems so, at, you know, out of date, really, when you think two massive, hardback, heavy volumes <coughs> crammed with systematic reviews published in 1989, uh, one of pregnancy systematic reviews, one of childbirth systematic reviews, but so innovative, and I have to say, such a pleasure to read. I learned all my methods from reading these books, and you know, a, a, a lesson in clarity that we could learn from today, I think. Um, then, you know, the whole world got, got to grips with it. We had a meeting in Oxford in 1993. There are some of those people. Thankfully, this photo is really blurred. <laughs> uh, uh, but there are some of those people, I think Clive Adams and uh, many of the people in that photo in the room now, but we all look almost the same as we did then. <laughs> 77 people from nine countries got together to tackle how on earth could we make this thing happen? And really, that's why we ended up with this kind of assorted array of groups of different sizes with different foci, with different disciplines all involved in, you know, a joint endeavour, but doing it many different ways. And life was so simple then. We had a vision. We still have that vision to prepare, maintain, and disseminate systematic up-to-date reviews of RCTs, it was just then, of healthcare. There was this sense that reviews were easy, that we could all do, you know, everybody come along and do a systematic review. Here's the software, it's really easy. You don't need much training, that was the ethos. You're all welcome. And the hardest thing we had to decide was, what apples and oranges, when do we put them together and make a fruit salad? When do we keep the apples and the oranges separate? That was the most, me most methodologically challenging Thing we had to think about. It's so different now. And it was all about health, not medicine, which was fabulous. It, it was an organisation that was uh, inviting and embracing for anybody who was interested in health. So these are the groups in the order in which they were registered, and there were midwives and nurses and therapists and patients and consumers all involved from the beginning, which is fantastic. Um, and my, my own group, the Wounds Group, as you can see, was uh, registered in 1995 and was, had, had lots of nurses in it and was led by a nurse, but always had surgeons, always had doctors, always had other kinds of people in it, as did pretty much all these groups. But there's a challenge in that because um, these different groups and consumers all come with diverse histories, different cultures, different traditions across healthcare, and that makes this kind of collaboration enriching and challenging at the same time. And it, and it was challenging for me as a nurse in, a, uh, in an academic, fairly new academic tradition. Many people would still regard nursing as really not an academic tradition, with a very short history of research. So this is a, a, a nursing research timeline that, that I sort of put together for this talk. And, and look at how crammed it is at the right-hand end. So we've got uh, Flo's notes on nursing in about 1860, which is, in a way, the first nursing research. And there was a very long time after that until the first academic department of nursing was at Yale in, 20, in 1923. First nursing PhDs in the States in the early 50s. <coughs> Um, the first UK-based degree in nursing at, at Edinburgh in, in 1960. Um, this, um, one of my favourite things, was the Briggs Report in 1972, was uh, the first sort of national policy document that actually said nursing should be a research-based profession. And that was a really, you know, out-of-the-box thinking kind of thing to say at the time. And in fact, if you ever read the Daily Mail which I'm sure almost none of you do, That's, that still is an out-of-the-box way of thinking about nursing. What, that they should think and have degrees? You don't need degrees for nursing, many Daily Mail readers would say. This is where it's all gone wrong. Um, <laughs> uh, and the first randomised controlled trial published in, in a nursing journal was published in the journal Nursing Research in, in 1972, the first systematic review in 1985 in a nursing journal. We're still struggling 
2010, the Clinical Academic Training Pathway, funded by NIHR for nurses, midwives and allied health professionals, was launched. We're still struggling. How on earth do we help uh, non-medical clinicians have a clinical and academic career? So we're in a different place. So this is part of the sort of complexity of the cultures that was um, uh, occupying me when I tried to get nursing involved in the Cochrane Collaboration. A very strong anti-trial culture in nursing. It's still there. So this was published in 2008. Um, I do not think nursing, given its nature, can be researched. Randomised controlled trials are most useful with data that can be manipulated as independent and dependent variables, for example, in agricultural research. Nursing is just not researchable under randomised conditions. That was a view that was very strongly held in the early 90s when I became involved in Cochrane and Ian charged me with finding all the RCTs that had ever been done in nursing. Um, and it's a, re it's a view that you know, people still struggle with in nursing and, and midwifery where uh, experimentation is felt to be at odds with caring. So against that backdrop then, that's, that's the bit of the history. Um, uh, I want to sort of keep, well, I might revisit some of those concepts a bit later on, but let's look then at, that was then, this is now, we've come an awful long way. Is the evidence that Cochrane produces used? Well, there's some really um, encouraging data out there if you look for it. Um, so we've grown hugely, more than 40,000 contributors now, nearly 6,000 reviews, 53 review groups, an impact factor of 5.785. Looking at the download statistics for 2012, these are, this is the top 10 most frequently downloaded reviews in full text in 2012. And um, you'll see uh, it, it, obesity prevention in children, 21,500. Preventing falls in uh, old people in living in the community, 16,500. It's very difficult to judge download statistics. I think, well, is that good? Could we, you know, should it be more than that? I don't know how to judge it. So I looked at um, the download statistics for PLOS, the PLOS journals, for similar sorts of subjects. And this is a systematic review published in PLOS One a year ago, almost exactly. Um, so it's a year's worth of download statistics, uh, looking at um, obesity, but in a different way, looking more in an etiological sense at obesity, but still a similar sort of topic, uh, with 4,678 views as of about a week ago. Um, so we, pr we compare pretty well to that. Now, obviously, there are no access restrictions on this PLOS journal. Looking at the falls review, um, 60, of 16,500 downloads in 2012, I found a falls review, systematic review of meta-analysis in PLOS One, uh, published in 2012. Uh, it's been viewed si oh, just over 6,000 times. So those our download statistics, despite the fact we're not fully open access, are quite encouraging compared with those. I still think it probably should be more, but... Um, not, not bad. Another way of looking at use that um, you get obsessed with if you work in academia um, is impact factors. In other words, how often are our reviews cited in other people's research publications? And these are the impact factors uh, by group for 2012. And I say impact factors. There's a health warning on them. They're not real impact factors. They're widely calculated impact factors around the review group's outputs, because obviously only the Cochrane database as a whole has an impact factor. In 2012, that was, that was 5.785. We were 12th in uh, general and internal medicine in ISI, ranked 12th. You know, doesn't compare great with the New England Journal of 51.658, or PLOS Med is 15.2, uh, open access. Um, and you'll see there's huge variability in those uh, impact factors. Uh, uh, number one being breast cancer at about 10 by the looks of it. We don't actually have the precise numbers, but we have this graph <coughs> which you can sort of interpret. The big hitters, breast cancer, heart, tobacco addiction, public health. Um, but none of them terrible, actually. And they, this, the lowest impact factor is about one, which in nursing is really highly respectable. So uh, <laughs> as we'll see. 
So that's one sort of use, but most of us aren't really so motivated by impact factors. I don't do Cochrane reviews for impact factors. I do Cochrane reviews because I want to make evidence useful to people making decisions, and I think that's why most of us want to do Cochrane reviews. Are they used in guidelines then? So Anne Isinger at the um, UK Cochrane Centre has been doing some really fantastically useful work looking at the penetration of Cochrane reviews into clinical practice guidelines. We need to do more at capturing our impact in this way. It's really important. She's shown that um, up to the end of July last year, uh, 1,158 reviews from 47 review groups were in 238 guidelines including mainly NICE, but also quite a lot of World Health Organization guidelines. Uh, 202 reviews from pregnancy and childbirth a, a group have got into clinical practice guidelines, which is fantastic. The, the all-star is um, at the sign asthma guideline with 49 reviews in one guideline. Um, and you know, many of our reviews are used in more than one guideline. So that is, I don't know if it's, it's almost certainly not good enough, but it's some pleasing evidence that um, we are making some inroads into being useful to people writing up guidelines. And at the coordinating editors uh, meeting this morning, there was a really interesting discussion about uh, actually this almost certainly underestimates guideline penetration because quite often the guidelines are using the reviews but not citing them for reasons I can't even, well, can't refuse to go into now. But... Um, so that's an underestimate. I wanted to look about, a bit about nurses, midwives, allied health professionals. Are they writing and are they using guide, uh, Cochrane reviews? And I love, this is my best, my best bit of the talk, you can go to sleep after this. Um, <laughs> looking at whether nurses, midwives or allied health professionals are writing Cochrane reviews. This is the list of the top 15 most downloaded Cochrane reviews from 2012. And nine out of the 15 are authored, co-authored by a nurse, a midwife, or an allied health professional, which I think is um, fantastic. Um, but just as interesting, uh, in a slightly different way, is that, the, again, the top most downloaded reviews, I sort of questioned, and this is just my interpretation of this, comes with a bit of a health warning, I made a judgment, is this topic really in the core decision-making domain of nurses, midwives, or allied health professionals? And 14, in my view, out of 15 of the most downloaded systematic reviews from Cochrane Database are actually about nurse, midwife, or therapy decisions. Now, some of them are very clearly very multidisciplinary decisions, and you know you may think she's stretching it a bit, but they're, but they're, you know these are about preventing obesity, preventing older people falling, promoting breastfeeding, non-drug interventions for depression, uh, interprofessional collaboration. Let's face it, there aren't many doctors interested in that. Um, <laughs> interprofessional, <laughs> interprofessional <laughs> education, and there are not many interested in that either. <laughs> you know, smoking cessation, pressure sore prevention. The real core nursing, midwife, or allied health professional topics, I think. And I think, um, okay, it's not conclusive evidence, but I think this evidence is highly suggestive of us lot, I'll say now being very major users of the Cochrane Library, actually. And I think, doctors, you need to catch up a bit. <laughs> 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 Looking back at impact factors, um, the Coch our, indi our indicative impact factor for the wounds group is FAB, it's 4.4, which is streets ahead of the top wounds journal, it's 2.7. And, you know, not far off, the top surgical journal, bearing in mind a lot of our reviews are about surgical wounds and surgeons are doing them and reading them. Uh, Annals of Surgery has got an impact factor of 6.3, so pretty good. Compared with nursing, the top uh, nursing midwifery journals are not great. And the top journal is birth with an impact factor of 2.9. So Cochrane database of um, uh, 5.7 is pressed pretty well with that. Pregnancy and childbirth's impact factor, I don't know, I think it's around 10, but somebody may be able to correct me. Anyway, streets ahead of birth. So lots of citation activity. Somebody's using our research to 
to cite uh, in their own research. Is it useful? Well, there's not a lot of data or information out there that I could lay my hands on. Um, in terms of publications, there's a paper by uh, uh, a guy who's the editor of Obstetrics and Gynecology, who is also a Cochrane author. So he's a bit of an insider, and he's a clinician, and he's American, so he's got an interesting perspective. Obviously, we would love our reviews to be used much more in America, um, because it's a big country, and they've got lots of money, um, uh, and they've got a very expensive healthcare system. We could make a difference. Uh, we know that um, US physicians are not necessarily willing to pay for access to the Cochrane database. It's expensive compared with other things they access for them because there's not um, uh, comprehensive open access. Uh, they, their time for reading uh, is not reimbursed. The Cochrane Library, uh, so that the, the they're very US reasons, but then the reasons we can all learn from, um, Scott noted that the, U the Cochrane Library is not very user-friendly in terms of search. You have loads of clicks to get to anything. Searching is difficult. I find it difficult, so, you know, and I'm quite good on computers. Um, <laughs> there are other um, sources of evidence that are more trusted in the US. Difficulty extrapolating to individual patient decisions, difficulty dealing with statistics, with the graphs, with odds ratios, long, ponderous text, that is a recurring theme. The format emphasises data, not information. That is really important. I'll skip through quite quickly, you know, other pieces of research concluding very similar things. Again, a US dermatologist has very helpfully, again, published on his views of the Cochrane database looked at reviews in dermatological surgery, mainly well written, they're unbiased, they don't have these heavy-handed assertions that non-Cochrane reviews have, but they're too long. Uh, another uh, US plastic surgeon, this is my very favourite one, that Hal Williams brought to our attention, written by a plastic surgeon, he compared a Cochrane review and a non-Cochrane review on the same topic, which happens to be a wounds group topic. And looking at, you know, really core surgical thing about should we put surgical wound drains in or not. And had grave quality concerns in the non-Cochrane review um, and thought the, you know, the Cochrane review was far better quality and dealt with risk of bias far better than the non-Cochrane review. There has been some research by Cochrane insiders looking at whether midwives found Cochrane evidence useful, presented at last year's colloquium. Uh, they did surveys, focus groups uh, with um, qualified midwives, midwife teachers and students and found that 51% um, said they use Cochrane reviews all the time or often, but that didn't compare so well with the 91% who preferred you know, use professional guidelines all the time or often. And again, it's about access was difficult in real decision-making time, training is needed, Cochrane needs to be more visible. Presentation of evidence is an issue. They valued summaries, particularly plain language summaries, and we need to do those better. We need to make our Cochrane reviews more readable. This is a very clear message. And again, a bit of research um, done looking at 42 plain language summaries from the breast cancer group. And we are supposed to write plain language summaries to be understood by most readers without a university education. And when they, when they audited 42 plain language summaries, they found that 98% of them were written at a very high scientific <coughs> ac academic level. Certainly not plain language. They rewrote them in simple language with active uh, verbs and, and short sentences and massively improved readability. So I think we've been a bit complacent, haven't we, in, in Cochrane? We thought if we build it, they will come like the Field of Dreams movie. If we make this baseball pitch in this field of corn, you know, people will flood in. Well, they, you know, that people have used our evidence, but I think we could help them to use it more. And many of you will know that um, we're in, embroiled, I was going to say, that's probably the wrong verb, engaged. <laughs> energised, excited by uh, a new strategy, a new Cochrane strategy. We're trying to reimagine, if that's not too sick making it, but, um, uh, you know, how might we do all this better with our new strategy to 2020? It's got four key goals, 
uh, about producing evidence and making our evidence accessible. Let's just think about the accessibility issue. We want to make Cochrane evidence accessible and useful to everybody everywhere in the world, which is a big ambition. There are six objectives around uh, that um, goal, very much about something we need to think a lot about, user-centred design and delivery, really important, open access, crucial, as well as writing an accessible <laughs> language. Um, and, and having more multilingual information. But, but for me, this whole idea of user-centred de design and delivery is really, really crucial. Our reviews are huge, they're text-heavy, they're comp complicated to read, very hard to produce. We need to do that better. One of our key um, uh, strategies for improving readability and accessibility is the summary of findings table, along with the plain language summary. And summary of findings tables are still quite new in Cochrane uh, and really, really challenging, I would say, for authors and for editorial bases to keep tabs on and understand what authors are doing, have done, uh, you know, in compiling these. Despite what people say, I think they require quite a sophisticated level of epidemiological understanding. Um, even if you let Grade Pro do the chunking of the information, uh, you still need to put in some baseline risks for, for events at different risk strata. And most reviewers, even if they're doctors, I have to say, uh, don't know what you're on about <laughs> when, you, when you ask them about that. Uh, and find this really uh, difficult to do. And then review ba editorial bases, places like um, where we work, in the Wounds Group, in York, and we have to try and work out what on earth authors have done when they've compiled this summary of findings table and have they done the right one. And if they've got lots of comparisons in their review, they've got lo they need loads of summary of, of findings tables. It's complicated. The state of play, though, thanks to Javier and to Toby for this, is actually really surprisingly good, 21% of all reviews in the CDSR have a summary of findings table. Of the ones updated or done in the last 12 months, nearly half have a summary of findings table, which is really good news. The value of summary of findings table is they frame the evidence, they display the uncertainty, and they're very clear about the quality of the evidence. They're a great tool for doing reviews if they're done properly, because they allow the authors to understand much better what their evidence is saying and how confidently it is saying it. But they are not easy, I think. So how can we enhance usability? Well, um, open access is a, an obvious partial solution. Understanding our users and their experiences, I don't think we've got a good handle on that, nor on the diversity of our users and the diversity of their consequently their experiences. We need to think more about structure and presentation of reviews at my pet desire is to have a very short, simple front end with actually most of the stuff, not even there unless you drill into it. We've partially got that now, but it's, for me it doesn't really work. Um, summary of findings tables are a great idea, but I think people need a lot more support than they get at the moment in producing them. And they're, you know, like some, some of the things we need, the software for these needs to be part of the same software that we do the reviews in. At the moment you have to use two different sorts of software two different pieces. I think review groups could help with some solutions, for example, having some baseline risks for different outcomes, for different risk strata that they can give to authors. But, um, you know, yeah. Uh, we need to make sure that we uh, implement the, for those of you who don't know what it stands for, the methodological expectations of Cochrane intervention reviews or the Messier standards, which is... Uh, big list of standards for the conduct and reporting of reviews. We do need to do better and more, uh, well, in fact, more than copy editing, I think. I think we need more technical editing and better plain language summaries to improve readability, improve the searching. The problem with this massive wish list is we're always asking uh, review groups and authors to do more with less. So we need to do it, as Tom said, more efficiently and more imaginatively and prioritise more, I think. So again, looking back at our goals, producing evidence is goal one and there are seven objectives around that evidence production goal. But many or all of which fall on 
uh, authors and review groups to deliver. And that's, uh, you know, I think a big challenge because if you think back to the early days where a voluntary organisation based on enthusiasm and people giving their time freely and then we have a small cadre of paid people running after the volunteers with the big stick, basically. So do it quicker, do it better. Do it quicker, do it better. And while you're at it, you write better as well. It's really hard. <laughs> so, you know, in the early days, prepare. We wanted to do this simple thing. Now we have 260 standards in Messia to implement at an author and review group level. Uh, we need to do these new summary findings tables. We need to prioritise review topics. If we do that better, a lot of the other things will be more straightforward, I think. But we need a mechanism for doing that. We need to do regular updating so the evidence that's there is up to date. We need to prioritise that updating. We also have to, and this is in the strategy, these are the objectives, implement uh, pioneering methods, new methods, diagnostic test accuracy reviews, Mixed treatment comparison meta-analysis. These are hard things, and there is a limited body of people able to do them. We need to increase that critical mass urgently, I think. We need to improve the efficiency of what we do, and we're lo looking, we are actively all looking at ways in which we can do that, improve readability and accessibility. Uh, our new task, one, one of which, well, several of us are sort of railing against a little bit because I'm not sure it's in the right place. Every review to have a clear dissemination strategy. So now we've got to be epidemiologists, brilliant journalists and communicators, and expert disseminators as well. Okay. Okay. But it's worth it because um, we need more investment in review production. I'm not saying we need more investment from NIHR in, re in review production. I'm saying we need to invest more within the collaboration in review production, because, as Mr. Spock told us many years ago, ins insufficient facts always invite danger. That sounds like a mnemonic for something, but uh, I don't know. <laughs> I haven't had time to work out what. So, you know, the, you know, the great example of the importance of having all the facts and having them well summarised is the Tamiflu example, uh, the 2008 review of neuraminate immunidase inhibitors for preventing and treating influenza in healthy adults and children. 2008 review concluded that Tamiflu, it's easier to say than Oseltamivir, I'm sorry. I, I, I prefer generics, but I've got to say Tamiflu because I can't say Oseltamivir. Um, reduced complications <laughs> from flu, but that the, those reviewers at that time only had partial access to eight industry-funded trials. After much wrangling, they got all the data, reanalyzed and updated this review, only a, a published a, two or three weeks ago, concluded does not reduce hospitalizations. The data problems precluded robust conclusions about flu, but does reduce symptoms by half a day or less, by less than a day. Department of Health, using the best available information at that time, let's not beat them up about that, that's all they had, spent half a billion quid on it. How important it is to have all the evidence well summarised in a timely fashion and kept up to date. What money we could save. You, so I'm drawing to a conclusion. You, start, is Cochrane evidence used? Yes, we've got some evidence it is by clinicians and researchers and guideline developers to some extent. Lots of scope for increasing use with, through means I've already alluded to. Obviously, if we were doing more of the reviews that people needed, but through better prioritisation, we could also increase use. Are they useful? Probably. I guess, you, I guess the biggest uh, usefulness uh, data is the Tamiflu uh, evidence I've just shown you. But uh, the data on how useful people find the evidence is hard to find. There is undoubtedly huge scope for increase. These reviews have too many words, too many graphs, too many tables can be difficult to understand, and they are not necessarily geared towards helping decision-making. We could definitely make these more usable. We need to look at review structure, make sure it's fit for purpose, and I think invest more in the review production process, rather than you know um, being terribly, terribly self-critical and critical of review groups and authors who are doing a, I think, <coughs> sterling job with relatively small resource, we need to look at how can we use the resource we've got better, more effectively, and enhance the accuracy and clarity of our messages,
do better plain language summaries, give support and thought to how we implement the messier standards, including you know, things like getting RevMan, prompts for messier standards into RevMan, and having open access. Thank you very much. Thanks, Nikki. Um, I promise you that at the end, we're going to get both speakers up to come to the front and we'll have a question and answer session. So our second speaker hardly needs any introduction either. I've actually known Trish. I worked it out 36 years. We were medical students together all that time ago. Now, we have a mutual agreement. We're not going to divulge any stories about our youthful indiscretions. That's true, isn't it? Good. Excellent. <laughs> uh, I'm glad about that. So Trish, she's a prolific writer, a very eclectic sort of thinker. And one of the few people I thought I can confidently invite her to come and be challenging and provocative as, as she wants to be, because I absolutely know that she and we share the same fundamental desire, which is to give patients, to help patients get the very best care and treatment. And so, Trish, be as provocative and challenging as always. Thank you very much. Thanks, Martin. Martin, you get me a Yes, sir. Thanks. I'm going to start off by um, asking Paul to get the IT working. Okay. I think I need to go up there. Oh, excellent. There we go. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. Well, ladies and gentlemen, feel free to tweet. I think Nikki has just given us an excellent talk, very much within paradigm, within the Cochrane paradigm. Um, and I'm going to give you one that's outside the paradigm. If you like, Nikki's been talking about the internal validity of everything that, that this collaboration does, and I'm going to focus more on its external validity. Um, well, yeah, we all go back a long way, don't we? I do feel very grey today. Um, the the Cochrane collaboration is about the same age as my youngest son. There he is. Um, and I remember this because very late one night, it was at least half past 10, I swear, um, in November 1991, and I was heavily pregnant and about to go to bed, and there was a knock at the door, um, and in walked Andrew Herxheimer, who'd just come from a meeting in Oxford. He was very excited, and it wouldn't wait till tomorrow, because he said, we just had this meeting, and we're going to set up uh, a database of all high-quality, randomised, controlled trials. There's Andrew in my living room last week. Um, <laughs> He lives near me. Um, and he, we're going to call this after Archie Cochrane. I'd never heard of Archie Cochrane, so he told me all about Archie, which that wouldn't wait till tomorrow. And the idea was that by indexing and summarising the results of randomised trials, as, as Nikki's already said, this was the beginning, um, what was going to happen was that uh, we were going to resolve uncertainties, we were going to reduce variation in clinical and public health practice, and uh, thereby make health services more effective and more efficient. OK, so, you know, 21, 22 years, 21 years on, ne nearly 23 years from that first idea. Um, if Andrew's prediction had been correct, then there should now be very little uncertainty uh, in medicine these days. So I thought we'd start with last week's BMJ, or this week's BMJ. Um, so let's see what the, this week's BMJ's got to offer. So first up is this data linkage study by our friend Chris McManus. Um, which states the uncontroversial scientific fact that um, uh, graduates of non-UK medical schools are not very good at taking our postgraduate exams. So that leads to a, a spate of articles in the newspapers about the dangers of being treated by foreign doctors. Now, surely all we need is a robust, systematic review, and that would resolve all the controversies here, wouldn't it? All right, well, well let's leave that aside, because it's not a meta-analysis, but the BMJ also had some meta-analyses. Now, it included this, uh, from what I can judge, not being an expert, a methodologically excellent study on the impact of treating children in low- and middle-income countries with antibiotics to boost their growth. I'm sure you'll agree that um, this forest plot, which summarises the 10 papers that made it through the critical appraisal mill out of an initial sample of about 4,500 titles. I'm sure you'll all agree that this is going to tell the world's policymakers, practitioners and parents which children should be given which antibiotics and for how long. 
No? Then come and join me in the Cochrane Chorus. More research is needed. <laughs> Now, I think it's a great reflection of, of Martin Burton's moral courage that the whole theme for this year's symposium is Cochrane Review, useful, usable, used, question mark. Now, I heard Nikki's presentation. I can see that there is a way of lining up the evidence to show that all, everybody, even half of all nurses, use Cochrane Systematic Reviews. That probably reflects Nikki's circle of friends, but... Um, <laughs> I would suggest to you, the reason why you chose that title was that despite the um, efforts of dozens of working groups, 53 working groups, was it, and thousands of contributors around the world, and I have contributed to Cochrane Reviews. I've got one that I'm slogging around at the moment. Um, I would suggest to you, and this is the provocative bit, that the methods and outputs of the Cochrane collaboration are as much part of the problem as part of the solution. Despite, indeed, I'm going to argue, because of very tight protocols, now you've got 240, 260 standards, um, and this focus on methodological rigour and transparency, Cochrane reviews, I'm going to suggest, are accumulating in a parallel universe to the pressing questions of clinical practice and health policy. Now, I know you can pull out examples where that isn't the case, but actually, let's look at the totality of what's going on. These reviews have a longer gestational period than an elephant. As such, <laughs> they're out of date the moment they're published. Almost all of them conclude that everything's a bit fuzzy and more research is needed. Their interpretation is contested, sometimes acrimoniously so, and one or two of them have a nasty smell of vested interests around them. Now, on top of all these problems, many Cochrane reviews are so mind-numbingly boring that almost nobody reads them. By boring, I mean they're so dry, they're so data-heavy, and they're so achingly decontextualised that it's hard to apply them to anything real. And I'm talking about the Cochrane reviews that I've written as well. You know, there, I mean, there's something about the genre that where boringness is kind of built into them. <laughs> so, rather than bore you all with examples of Cochrane reviews that sent me to sleep, um, I thought I'd talk about a distinctly unboring randomised trial, which was done by Archie Cochrane himself. So. As you probably know, Archie Cochran was a public health physician. He began his clinical career treating his fellow prisoners, uh, prisoners of war, in a place called Salonika in Greece after being captured by the Germans uh, in the Second World War. And many years later, he published this paper in the BMJ, Sickness in Salonika, my first, worst, and most successful clinical trial. I mean, it wouldn't get into the BMJ now, but um, so I'm going to quote from a recent biography of Archie Cochrane, which I found uh, uh, recently by Antonio Stavrou and colleagues. Um, and he said this, he said, what led Cochrane to conduct the trial was the high incidence of ankle edema of unknown origin among the prisoners. Turn my glasses off. He hypothesized that the underlying cause was vitamin deficiency, resulting in wet beriberi, as the prisoners were provided with scanty nutrition of four to 500 calories a day. And he expressed his concerns to the Germans, who firmly refused to help. He bought yeast and vitamin C supplements from the black market in the camp, and then he randomly selected a sample of 20 prisoners, dividing them into two groups of 10. Subjects in the first group received daily portions of yeast. Those in the other were given vitamin C. After four days, Cochrane confidently observed that the prisoners in the yeast-eating group had improved. The ankle edema had subsided. The subjects felt better. There was no change in the other group. He carefully wrote down the results of this primitive clinical trial and presented them to the Germans, who then agreed to provide the camp prisoners with yeast. So why wasn't this char boring? To answer that question, I think we've got to look beyond medicine, to the arts and humanities, and specifically to the philosopher Aristotle in his timeless monograph, Rhetoric. So... A good narrative, said Aristotle, is set in a context. It occurs at a particular time in history and a place in the world. 
It depicts human characters of greater or lesser virtue, the goodies and baddies, as we called them in our childhood, um, some of whom get into trouble. That is, they find themselves facing a bad outcome, such as death. Someone then uh, expends effort and typically takes some risks to try to get the people out of trouble. And the account of how these efforts unfold is known as the plot. In a good, that is, non-boring narrative, the plot is characterised by surprise and suspense, the classic cliffhanger. And the ending achieves what literary scholars call moral order. In other words, unless we're talking complex plots like irony or melodrama, the goodies are supposed to win. OK, let's try this again then. During an evil and prolonged war, the bad Germans captured the honourable British, starved them till they got desperately sick and ignored their pleas for mercy. Fortunately, the prisoners had a hero among them, a respectable doctor who happened to speak fluent German and who, after reasonable attempts at dialogue had failed, broke the rules to obtain some yeast as a potential cure for the sickness. Our hero was a true scientist and ran a controlled experiment which served to persuade even the bad Germans that the supplement should be given. From that point, all were supplemented and got better. Okay, all lived happily ever after. Now, the success of Archie Cochrane's trial was only partly about science. It was also about the use of scientific evidence to influence and persuade. Now, somehow, and we'll never know exactly how, the study's results were fed into a complex ethical negotiation on the rights of prisoners and the duties of captors, as these played out in Salonika in the oppressive summer of 1941. So to return to Aristotle, rhetoric, the art of persuasion, consists of three components. Logos, the facts, the message, the evidence, um, is, is one component. The other two are ethos, the credibility of the speaker, and pathos, the speaker's ability to appeal to the audience's emotions and stir their moral imagination. Now, all three uh, aspects of rhetoric were very strikingly evident when the young Dr. Cochrane was negotiating with his captors, which is why it was such an interesting story. Now, it's time to return to the theme of boringness. When Martin first asked me to speak at this symposium, we had a long conversation on the phone um, about how the, this very rational approach that's uh, been developed by the Cochrane Collaboration and, and greatly refined over the years um, was sometimes in danger of missing the wood for the trees. It reminded me of Ursus Verley's brilliant work on tidying up art, in which he illustrates how in our efforts to reduce complexity and sort out messiness and rationalise the, the thing we're looking at, we fundamentally distort the phenomenon that we're trying to understand. So here's my central message. The machinery of systematic review that's been so carefully and robustly developed by the Cochrane Collaboration sometimes serves to strip away all those elements of a scientific study that make a compelling narrative. The founding principle of Cochrane systematic reviews is that the best way to summarise primary evidence is to produce an abstracted, context-free and universally transferable grand mean. Now, I signed up to this principle for many years, but I've subsequently, time and again, found myself struggling with it. <laughs> Let me emphasise that I believe there are situations in, in which stripping away context and, and kind of going for that, that nugget of pure scientific truth that must be in there somewhere, um, sometimes that effort is helpful. But in the buzzing, blooming, globalised confusion of the modern world, those situations are increasingly unusual. Most of the time, our evidence reviews need to engage with complexity and messiness, not try to simplify it, average it out, or tidy it up. OK, our picture's finished, I'm afraid. Let me tell you about two forms of systematic review that are designed to engage with complexity and mess. 
One of them is realist review or realist synthesis, which was developed by Ray Pawson and his team. Uh, and the other is meta-narrative review, which was developed by myself and my team. Both have recently come of age with uh, the development of the Ramesses quality criteria and publication standards. We know we've got to have a set of criteria because otherwise you people won't speak to us. Ramesses stands for <laughs> realist and meta-narrative evidence synthesis evolving standards. That means we can keep going back and asking for more money to update them. Um, I'll be running a workshop at half past one tomorrow on, on these approaches. Um, okay, so to illustrate how realist review might add value to conventional systematic review, I'm going to tell you about this paper by uh, Douglas Noble, who was then my PhD student, and he was a public health trainee. He's now much more important, got his PhD. Um, Douglas's day job at the time um, involved taking steps to reduce the incidence of type 2 diabetes in the East End of London. It's a very deprived part of London, very ethnically diverse. There's a lot of diabetes. Um, so he, went, he got sent off to look for a risk score that he could use on GP computer systems and get the GPs to run this score and then pick out the people who are at high risk of diabetes and then offer them interventions to stop them getting it. Um, so that was his job. So he came along to me. Um, and we, just, we found there was no systematic review, so he went off to do a systematic review. But he needed one that was acceptable and feasible and workable in the context of uh, GPs in the East End of London. And he went off and he found lots and lots of papers, either a systematic search, all that kind of thing, and found that almost all, in fact I would say every single author of 94 papers looking at, uh, which had developed and validated 140 risk scores, um, every single one of those authors had one primary goal, which was to increase the area under the rock curve. Okay, so that was what they were doing. Here's um, the first of about 10 pages of tabulated results, and one of those columns will give you the area under the rock curve. Boring? It certainly was. Um, but what made it interesting was that Douglas, who'd been seconded to me from what was then the PCT, it's now the CCG, he wasn't being paid to do this PhD. They didn't even know he was doing the PhD. That was the sort of bit he was doing on the side. What he was being paid to do was find a usable risk score. Um, and this very strong policy focus um, led us to a very important conclusion, which was that it would never be possible to pull out and say, this is the best diabetes risk score from our clever systematic review. Um, it wouldn't be possible to do that without paying attention to the practicalities and priorities of the local context in which that risk score might be put to use. So here's where the realist component of our systematic review started, because that, that wasn't, you might have noticed, that wasn't realist review, that this is the bit that was realist. And, and in a way, we were making this up as we went along, because it, it was something that we We'd come, up, we'd come up with this problem and we needed to sort of address it. Um, so I said, why don't we try applying some, some of the sort of realist science? So we went through the 94 or so papers um, and we asked about the author's assumptions. Who did they assume was going to use this risk score on which groups or subpopulations? And what did they think was going to be offered to people who scored above the cutoff? OK, so we've done, run the risk score. You're high risk. What's going to happen to you? Um, are we going to refer you? Are we going to send you? Are we going to treat you? Um, what did they... Um, how... That is, by what mechanism did the authors think that using this score was going to improve outcome? Now, this is where the realist bit comes in. Because realist scholars are particularly interested in the relationship between a program such as offering screening for high risk of diabetes, um, the context in which it's delivered, and the mechanisms by which outcomes are achieved. Now, what we found uh, going through those papers, and I was actually quite shocked, was that most of these, author these authors had only a very, very hazy idea about how their very statistically robust risk score was going to be used in practice. Um, and this is the most staggering finding of all. Out of 140 risk scores, only seven of them had ever been used outside a research setting in real-world clinical practice. And even fewer, the, the real-world use of that risk score had actually been evaluated. I think it was only about one or two. 
Um, so this led us to develop a preliminary set of usability questions based on realist methodology to ask about a risk score. Okay, so I'm not, that's all I'm going to tell you today about realist review. And, and I think this is very preliminary. This is, this is really, you know, this is the sort of thing that what realist science needs to do a bit more work on. Um, but I'm, I've just given it to you to illustrate how realist methodology might be able to help address this question of producing systematic reviews that are more use, useful and usable. Okay. I'm going to give you a similar, very quick skim through meta-narrative review, um, which was born about 10 years ago, um, inspired by another kitchen table discussion with Andrew Herxheimer, who you already know lives near me and comes around late at night and has discussions about Cochrane reviews and how to improve them. Um, so meta-narrative review, as the name implies, uses narrative methods. You know all about narrative methods now because it's all about characters and plot and suspense and surprise and all that kind of thing and moral order. Um, it uses narrative methods to surface and explore the context in which primary studies have been done, how the results of earlier studies influence the design of later studies. So it's, it's got a historical unfolding over time element um, and how one set of ideas about the world was dialectically <coughs> replaced by another. So in some, meta-narrative review seeks to produce a meaningful story of the unfolding of the scientific endeavour over time. So the first meta-narrative review was my team's uh, systematic review of the diffusion of inno innovation literature, which was published in Millbank Quarterly in 2004. Um, we found that different research teams in different disciplines had researched the topic in different ways. Uh, and sometimes they'd come up with the same findings, and sometimes they'd come up with diametrically opposite findings. So we then had to think, now why did this team doing it this way at that time come up with this finding, but that team doing it there with those, that approach came up with a different finding? Um, and what we then did was we came, you know, we got a very complex sort of model set of ideas. We presented it to a critical audience who came back and said, well, you don't know what you're doing, don't like the way you've done that. And, and there was a lot of sort of peer review going on. We called it the fishbowl. Um, as a result of all that deliberation, we built a multi-level model of how innovations arise and how they spread both within and between organisations. Now, importantly, our review had been commissioned to address an urgent question that had been posed by the Department of Health in about 2002-2003. Why do so many good ideas that arise in the NHS fail to spread? So, this is the picture we came up with. I think perhaps partly because of the pressure to produce an answer to what was seen as a very urgent policy question. It was all about innovation and modernisation. Do you remember the, the early 2000s? Um, our review took us down a lot of routes that we had not planned to explore. Um, it was absolutely impossible to write a protocol and just stick to it all the way through. Um, so, for example, after we, we literally threw in the bin this very strict search protocol that was going to uncover all the papers on, on innovation and their diffusion, we chucked that in a bin and we started exploring a little bit more organically, shall we say, and very widely. Um, we uncovered... Um, a very rich empirical literature from business and management studies about what, uh, on a topic which is now known as networked innovation. Now, we didn't discover this. It had been in the literature, but actually it wasn't something that was being talked about within the health services research community at all. And it, it hadn't, you know, it, it, we thought, oh, my, this is a real seam that we've got to mine. Um, so this was all about the importance of inter-organisational networks, both formal and informal, uh, in the spread of ideas. Now, this section of our review in particular was picked up almost immediately by policymakers. Uh, and then, you know, they summoned us and we presented them. We're going to see Liam Donaldson, who was then chief medical officer, and he, this was a bit he was most interested in. Um, this networked innovation explained the success of things like the quality improvement collaboratives, um, and it also informed the original tenders for things like the Academic Health Sciences Networks and the Clarks uh, in the UK. So this diffusion of innovations review um, breaks every rule in the Cochrane Handbook, without a doubt, every single one of them. 
Um, if it doesn't break them, it just ignores them. But it's by far the most widely cited paper that I've ever published. It's been cited well over 2,000 times. It's the most widely cited paper that's ever been published in Millbank Quarterly. You know, it really took off, and it's had huge impact on policy. So, and, and I, I, it's fantastic to be able to come back 10 years later and say, I broke all the rules. Um, but it was kind of a good story. Um, so, meta-narrative review has got some conceptual similarities with meta-triangulation review, which is another um, a, a comparable uh, theory-driven review method, which was developed by Marianne Lewis independently of what I was doing, and I didn't know about it at the time, but we've since been in touch. Um, both of the approaches um, reject the need for a detailed protocol um, at the outset of the review. In fact, they, they say that you can't have, you simply can't have one until you've seen what comes back. Um, though both do require a clear research question that can be and must be progressively focused as the review unfolds. Both methods place more emphasis on theory and interpretation than on method. Both use the narrative form to preserve richness and to create meaning in the synthesis of complex evidence. And both are now being quite widely applied by researchers who are looking to, to find reviews that really sort of encompass what the whole of a, a complex topic is about um, and inform policy. Okay, so that's meta-narrative review. And if you want to hear more about those, come, come to the workshop tomorrow. Now, this is where I'm going to get really provocative because I don't expect anyone in this room to agree with me. Um, I think this collaboration, which I, yeah, I'm a great fan of the Cochrane collaboration, but I think that in the spirit of scientific rationalism on which this collaboration was founded, I think you've branded yourselves on two false premises. The first is that logos, the evidence, can be equated with legitimate scientific inquiry, but ethos and pathos are sort of nasty, grubby contaminants. And what, what you've got to do is get rid of those, kind of purge them out to, to get the pure bit of logos. Um, actually, logos, ethos, and pathos were all recognised by the ancient Greek philosophers as legitimate forms of scholarship. Um, so that's, that's my first false premise. I'm sure you'll, you'll want to respond to this. Andrew van der Ven has argued that in the messy worlds of management and policymaking, factual knowledge can rarely, if ever, be cleanly separated from the social meaning or the moral ends, honourable or dishonourable, towards which stakeholders seek to apply that knowledge. So to paraphrase the epitaph on Karl Marx's tombstone, I might not bring Marx in, um, scientists who hide away in their ivory towers pursuing the holy grail of the perfect forest plot or the maximum area under the rock curve are missing the essence of true scholarship, which is, Marx argued, to change the world. And we're more likely to change the world if we ask ourselves, when doing a review, who is going to use these findings, for what purpose, and under what constraints? The second false premise that I believe the Cochrane collaboration needs to revisit, and this, is, this one's really scary, is the assumption that method is what assures quality in systematic review. I've heard this perspective described by those outside the collaboration as methodological fetishism, or in some circles, methodological fascism. The obsessive privileging of method over theory, process over thinking, and means over ends. Here's an alternative perspective from Professor Maggie McClure, who once went on a systematic review course, didn't enjoy it, and she felt that it had crushed the very essence of scholarship out of the process of review. And this is what Maggie said. Conventional systematic review assumes that evidence can be extracted intact from the texts in which it is embedded and synthesized in a form that is impervious to ambiguities of context, readers' interpretations, or writers' arguments. 
Most significantly of all, systematic review systematically degrades the central acts of reviewing, namely reading and writing, and the unreliable intellectual acts that these support, such as interpretation, argument and analysis. By replacing reading and writing with an alternate lexicon of scanning, screening, mapping, data extraction and synthesis, Systematic Review tries to transform reading and writing into accountable acts. It tries to force their clandestine operations, the bits that happen inside people's heads, up into plain view, where they can be observed, quality controlled, and stripped of interpretation or rhetoric. Now, Maggie McClure is putting forward here some very major philosophical and ideological challenges to scientific rationalism, which you'll be relieved to hear I don't plan to go into here, except to note rationalism's strong focus on the technical processes of extracting, sorting, and categorizing, and its links to managerial control and accountability. So those of you who feel that your Cochrane Review Group has become too bureaucratic and controlling will find solace in the critiques of scientific rationalism by people like Paul Feyerabend, or somewhat less radically, Michael Lochlin. An overemphasis on methodological ver verification of scientific truth, Lochlin argues, means that all features of experience not revealed by those methods are deemed subjective in a way that suggests they're either not real or they lie beyond the scope of meaningful rational inquiry. This devalues capacities that are in fact essential components of good reasoning and virtuous practice. Now, before you dismiss these critiques of scientific rationalism entirely, think how often in the last 21 years a Cochrane Review and meta-analysis has paradoxically increased the uncertainty and ambiguity around a clinical or policy question, rather than, as we all sort of hoped and expected, reducing these. Or how, as Ben Goldacre and Peter Gertscher have described, the pharmaceutical industry, driven by corporate ends, so often manages to position itself inside rather than outside the evidence-based medicine tent. Let me conclude by reminding you of how in 1938, 10 years before the NHS was set up, the young Archie Cochrane marched on Whitehall holding a placard stating, all effective treatments must be free. Archie's dream of a register of randomised controlled trials was not built on a vision of dispassionate scientific endeavour unadulterated by ideology or politics. It was built on a vision of science mobilised in the service of social justice by people who cared passionately about a fair society. It was focused not on method but on purpose, not on means, but on ends. If the arguments I've put forward today against the naive extremes of scientific rationalism are even partially correct, it follows that the problems currently facing the Cochrane collaboration are not going to be fixed by yet another refinement in methodology. Rather, I would suggest to you, what is needed is a broadening of the church to embrace not merely qualitative methods, but more fundamentally, interpretivist and realist philosophy. And then within this broader church, I would like to see a reassessment of the place of method in relation to the theory and purpose of the scientific endeavor. So thank you for your attention. I very much look forward to the discussion that follows. Nikki, would, would you like to come and join Trish now? Um, do we have some roving microphones here? Uh, yes, we, we, we do. So would you, I'm very happy to take questions. I'm going to take the first one. Uh, uh, it's going to be uh, over here. Would you mind just saying who you are, 
And uh, just a bit about you know, where, where you're from before you give your question. And if there's any, if we don't quite hear it, I'll, I'll repeat it. But the first question is Mona, just uh, over there. Mona, it's you. Yep, the, the, here comes the microphone. Um. Hi, uh, I'm Mona Nasser. I'm a clinical lecturer in Plymouth University, and I'm the co-convener of the Pride Setting Methods Group. Um, thank you very much. This was a lovely presentation. Really enjoyed both presentations. Um, I'm not old enough to be have to be on the first meetings of the Cochrane Collaboration, so I appreciate the history. And as a kind of somebody who came later on and watching the collaboration, kind of from as outside and gradually coming a bit more inside. Um, I saw the collaboration as an organization who sought out of box at the time from the environment I was coming from. And, um, but gradually, uh, as you go inside, is some of the issues that Trish is raising, I heard them in meetings from people who are kind of key people in the collaboration. And um, like Anne Hengtemeyer, I have seen the Metros meeting raising the issues about kind of thinking about narratives and storylines and reviews and rather than quality. But somehow this, this kind of ideas doesn't become a central policy, a central discussion in collaboration. So I'm wondering whether we have lost this broadness of thinking and accepting out of our box ideas and how we can achieve a culture change to think broader or be more receptive when we have out of context question raised in our own inside the meetings to be able to take them take them on board. Okay, so the question is how can we achieve the culture change? Shall we have a view from inside and perhaps outside the collaboration? Nikki, do you want to uh, Do you think, how do we achieve that culture change? Well, I think, um, I mean, Trish, as always, is, is really, really thought-provoking. And I think it's very difficult for a big collaboration as diverse as, as we are to have a, where's our, where does our thinking happen? Where's our group think? We don't ha really have a forum. Uh, you know, my initial response is not so much to your question as to Trisha's talk because she kind of makes you go, oh, and I'm thinking, well, there are a lot, I think there are, first of all, Cochrane isn't about doing everything. And I think, uh, I think the danger is the more we try to do everything brilliantly, the more we end up doing nothing useful or well. And I think, uh, I th I, what, a lot of what Trish says absolutely resonates with me, but it, some of it I say for my non-Cochrane world, because my Cochrane world <laughs> isn't everything. And I, and I think <laughs> there are aspects of healthcare that where we do need, you know, where actual, actually context isn't that important. Yeah. Where interventions are quite simple, are not complex, and the answers that we will get using the approaches we use will suffice. There are aspects of healthcare that Tricia really brilliantly uh, exemplified for us where this approach is stupid. Uh, but I, I am slightly nervous of thinking that Cochrane needs to do all of it because at the moment we're struggling even to do the simple stuff. Trish? Um, I think, I think that's, that's a very good way of, of putting it, Nikki, because I too, and it, I would like to just underline something I said in my talk, is that there is, there is a whole chunk of medicine, and I was, if you follow me on Twitter, you know I spent quite a lot of time in hospital in the last couple of months um, on a trauma ward, and actually I, it was jolly useful to be able to look up the Cochrane reviews on, on the drugs I was being treated with and all that kind of thing. So yes, fine, but what makes me very nervous is when we stray into the realm of complex interventions, there I've said it, I tried not to say it in my talk, actually, to use this approach, the, 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 the ultra-rationalistic approach to categorise and classify and score um, and sum up and try and get an average, actually you really are stripping away the very <coughs> thing that you need to be exploring. And the worry is that because Cochrane reviews have done so well, and they, you know, they really are fantastically robust, as, as Nikki's presentation showed, within their paradigm, the worry is that I mean, you know, I would never be able to publish any of my reviews in the BMJ, for example, unless I did a big conventional review and just tagged a realist review on the end of it. Um, because the BMJ would say, Cochrane reviews are the gold standard, therefore anything that isn't a Cochrane review is, is some kind of lesser species of... of, of and, and I think what we need is not a kind of hierarchy, but a garden. Um, and I think we need 
desperately need more dialogue and deliberation and acknowledgement that this approach is only going to be any use for simple interventions, is my view. Thank you. Uh, another question. Are you looking for hand? Yeah, yeah so, so uh, right at the back there, there's a microphone on, on its way to you. both of you for wonderful talks. Um, I'd like to just go back to, to Nikki to ask, it's a bit of a nitpicking point, I'm sorry, but um, at one point you put up usable and you, you put, you know, who, who the, the reviews were going to be used by. You included, I think it was researchers and clinicians. You didn't actually say patients. Um, in that case, you know, why do we bother with lay summaries? And of course, patients now, you know, they have access to the internet and they trawl through and they find... Uh, they, they go along to their doctors with great lists of things that they want to talk about. So um, I really do think it's important to make sure that not only do um, patients, users, consumers, whatever you call them, get in at the ground floor of, of doing um, reviews, but also that they're borne in mind as, as the consumers, the customers at the end of the, of, of the journey. Thank you very much. Thank you. Absolutely right. Good point. Well made. I think that slide was referring to where I'd found evidence of um, uh, attitudes to usefulness using Cochrane evidence. I don't think there's much written about, about patients, but absolutely important. Yeah. Do you Question. say who you are? Okay. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, many years, first in breast cancer and recently in stroke, and I now live in Edinburgh. Brilliant. So the next speaker is, is uh, uh, Rupert uh, here, just in the middle. Uh, Sam, thank you. I'm Rupert McShane. I'm the co-head of the Dementia Group. Um, in a way, this is really very challenging and poses a big problem for us because what Nikki put up was essentially that the most accessed and used reviews were all about complex interventions. Not all of them, but... But, 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 but I, you were making the point that in a sense the, the direction of travel for the use of the uh, collaborations literature has been towards that towards the um, professions allied to medicine rather than uh, medicine. So, and it is moving towards those, those care professions, if you like, rather than the, the simple interventional um, uh, reviews. And I wonder whether, in fact, that rather than that, that there's an element in this, which is, in fact, about, med, about medics abandoning the use of Cochrane reviews, just to be very challenging about it. You know. If, if it is the case that most of our users, that, that more and more of our users are in fact professions allied to medicine, um, that could have two explanations. Yeah. <laughs> we don't know. We don't have the information. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, what we do know, I mean, we don't really know who those professionals are. What we do know is that there's clearly a massive hunger for information about many complex interventions. So, I mean, yeah, it wasn't all, but a lot of it was. Uh, Barney. Uh, Barney Reeves. Uh, Non-randomised non studies methods group and University of Bristol. Um, <laughs> I really like something that Mark Pettigrew once said to me, and I haven't seen it widely disseminated, which, uh, to paraphrase it, I think, is we shouldn't be talking about complex interventions, only complex questions. I think you can ask very simple questions about complex interventions, and I've speculated with other Cochrane colleagues over some years about whether the famous stroke unit review that very much influenced me 15 years ago when it first came out, when I was just getting into reviews, could be done now. Because the terror of a systematic review author pooling all those enormously disparate stroke units would mean we'd never have enough power to get the overall answer. I mean, I guess the point is that I think 
we worry about context when we have a negative answer about a complex intervention. Um, if we have a positive answer about a complex intervention, then that spurs us on to try and identify be better, perhaps, um, what's causing that positive effect. I'd, I'd certainly defend doing that review today. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Yes, thank you. Over here, the far left-hand side. Hi, um, my name is Malik. I work for a charity called Asthma UK. I was just picking up on the points that were made that consumers come in different shapes and forms, and um, also that the Cochrane reviews can't be all things to all people. And I just wanted to offer up that medical research charities like Asthma UK can actually support um, Cochrane reviews, um, amplify the messages of the speakers work with you on you know tightening up those messages as well and ensuring wider reach to audiences so you do have allies out there <laughs> thank you very much thank you that's very helpful thank you. Yeah. yes okay uh, at the back please ian roberts cochrane injuries group there w there was a sort of the way that people laugh when you say that more research is needed implies that it's a sort of conclusion of derision. But I think it's the state of medicine. It's actually the right answer because most of the things we do to patients have never been shown to improve outcomes. And that's just the reality. And actually, you would expect for clinicians to say they're boring. You would expect people not to like them because they're profoundly challenging. They are challenging to a sort of professional hegemony of practice. Mm. That's actually based on sand. It's not based on anything firm at all. So all of these criticisms, you know, more research is needed, that's the right answer. Most things, you ha you're a trauma patient. Most of the things that happen to you would never have been shown to improve outcome. <laughs> Michael Schumacher injured his brain. He was cooled, he was put in a coma, he had stuff taken out of his head. It's all not based on any scientific evidence. Yeah. It's just what they thought might work. It's so it's the state of medicine. It's not a problem with the Cochrane collaboration. Yeah, can I, I, I accept that up to, up to a point. Um, one of the things that I think one of the most useful things we did with the Diffusion of Innovations Review, because we, we, we wanted to produce a story, a really rich picture of what exactly is this whole area of literature in diffusion of innovation? And what, one of the things we did was we had a list of areas where no more research was going to help us. So we, we, instead of saying well, more research is needed, we did say more research is needed in this, this, and this. But we also said, for example, there have been thousands and thousands of studies of the attributes of innovations. And you will have heard um, um, relative advantage, trialability, you know, those, those kind of six attributes of it. And they would go and get an innovation, it might be a guideline, it might be a piece of technology, and they'd describe the attributes of it, and they'd go and test attributes. And we said, no more <laughs> attribution studies, because it's not helping. And we demonstrated why that wasn't helping. We said, what we need is studies that are multi-level, multi-method, that actually engage with the complexities of these innovations in actual use. And so what we did was, sure, in a way we didn't say more research is needed, we said different research is needed, and here is where millions and millions of research pounds, dollars and yen are getting put into research that isn't going to help us. So I think just saying more research is needed is lazy. And I think it, it, it's because explanation and theory is downgraded way below method in this collaboration that the only thing you can conclude is, well, we just want more of it, we want bigger studies. I actually think if you, if you re increase the value and the priority of, of theory and explanation, you would then be able to say different research is needed. And then you'd be able to spend your, your research money a bit more, a bit more um, efficiently. Okay. Well, we started off 
with the talk about money from Tom. Uh, we've got to the end. It's six o'clock. I'm very keen that we keep to keep to time. Can I just ask you to, again to thank our two speakers? Thank you. So um, this has been a great start to the meeting. We look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Now, those that are coming to the dinner at the town hall, uh, the doors open at seven. We're actually going to go into dinner at quarter to eight and sit down to eat at eight. So if, if you're thinking, my word, have I got time to go back to the hotel and get to the town hall by seven? That's when we, the doors open at seven. You haven't got to be there bang on the dot of seven. So take your time, enjoy the next hour or so, and we'll see some of you for dinner and see you again in the morning. Thank you.